Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being here, for um, joining my talk today. Basically, as the title says, I would like to talk about maps today, as I did a um, couple of artworks around the medium of the map. Um, somehow they are quite a novel medium to me. It's like a you know, data visualization in the end. And when we talk about this, there are special issues we can address with it. But first of all, um, just a few words about Myself, this is my web page. Um, you can see I work with different, uh, let's say, medias and um, techniques from installations to performances, um, music, and whatever. So I'm going to try you now to leave it open in a way as well. And there was a time where I basically used map as a, as a method. Art is somehow like a watchdog of society. And what I want to do is somehow like to bear witness and um, to create stories about the time we are living at the moment. Because my um, opinion is that we know a lot, but when we cannot transport this, then um, basically this knowledge is somehow not so valued in a way. And I think what I would like to do is I would like to use art as a way to transport these narratives and stories. And in the end, also about tell stories about technology and algorithms, these kind of black boxes. Here are a couple of projects um, before I go into the main topic. For example, this is a project I did, which is called um, Zapfenstreich, Human Out of the Loop. And this project deals with a third revolution in modern warfare, which basically is autonomous weapon systems. And I mean, since a while, basically, this is discussed, um, for example, in the United Nations about how we're going to use, how should we use the technologies, um, let's say, you know, autonomous drones, vehicles on the battleground. And of course, um, there is this kind of you know, paradigm change uh, in the time we are living, because like back in the days, we had much more the military working on such technologies like autonomy in machines. But now these days, we have more like private companies, namely Google in this example, which also worked on um, pattern recognition algorithms that are being used in drones. And in this performance on this installation, what, I, what you see is like a self-playing trumpet and it plays the song of the Zapfenstreich. Um, the melody usually was made um, to symbolize the soldiers to retreat from the battleground. And I asked myself, how could a modern installation or um, let's say, yeah, story looks like to symbolize those machines to retreat. And here I made basically an autonomous trumpet that plays it. And in addition to, in addition to this, um, I placed the trumpet in front um, of the Google headquarter of Europe in Zurich and wanted to make the um, people in front but also inside the headquarter aware of that, you know, they are working on this kind of stuff. So this is like, you know, a combination of where I try to build installations on the one hand, but also use them into a kind of activism um, performance as well. The next project quickly is uh, this one, which is called um, Maps from Space. And in this project, I trained um, two machine learning models. Uh, one is trained on um, to identify or to create um, maps from satellite images. And the other one is trained on to um, do the opposite. And what you see here is like a drawing machine that draws a map. Then the machine learning model tries to understand the map, creates a satellite image out of it. And then the other model tries to understand the satellite image and draws a map out of it. And then you have this kind of closed circuit system, which is like a um, representation or like a narrative how um, we're going to use, for example, farmers in that sense, use it um, these days to um, rationalize and to measure their land. So basically what's been saying when you want to use the bird eye view from the satellite to, for example, uh, measure you know, the farmland and everything that grows, you need to be readable by these machines from the bird eye view. And therefore you have to restructure the surround, let's say the area or like the, the land in that sense, but also urban infrastructure is also using this, this technique. So here we see like an influence how this technology from the satellites shaped the area around us to be readable, how to be machine readable. And there are also um, these kind of stuff, which are more like, let's say, um, theoretical or a narrative to say like, okay, how can we live in the future that we as um, people have more power in the city we are living? And um, this 
example here or this project is called Air Market. And here the idea was that we sold, had an, a cube in the city center of Linz and we sold air marks or air cubes, so to say, to the people. So the idea was that you come to our office and uh, you give us data, personal data, and then from, from our end, you got um, airspace in the city um, on a, a certificate. And here the idea was that um, you then hold the right of the air in this, in, in this example, um, just above the cube. And whenever somebody um, comes and wants to build whatever, a skyscraper or a building, you have to be asked that, um, um, that they are allowed to build into your airspace. Um, that is, you know, was also um, kind of a project towards um, raising awareness of air quality and um, also the, the space we are living in the urban structure and that gives um, power back to the people. And then this is like another topic I'm getting, I mean, of course, during climate change, getting more and more into this, um, which is called digital nature. So in the pandemic, I worked at the electronic waste dump. And this was a time um, where a lot of um, four by three screen of four to three um, dimension screens got replaced by six into nine. You know, as we know, people went to home offices and so on. And suddenly at these waste stations, um, you, you will find a lot of these screens there and of course all of them working and to me it was quite clear that I have to do something with it and uh, to use it as a material, to, as a medium. And what we see here in this installation is uh, yeah, basically nature um, projected on those screens and this represents to me also on, on the other hand a way of how we perceive nature these days through the screen, right? We always have this kind of image that there's a lion jumping out of the bush or whatever, you know, it's kind of spectacular nature. But in fact, it's not like this, right? It's more like calm and quiet. And actually, we are um, basically nature um, takes a time. And on the other hand, this project represents to me also this kind of technosphere we are living in at the moment, uh, same as the, the stratosphere or the like ecosphere. It's like a like a sphere spanned around the globe where we interact with them. And it has an influence on us, but also now more and more, it has basically also an influence um, on the nature. And then maybe I gonna go over to the main topic of today. Ah, yeah, this is actually a video I did um, at the uh, race station. They have like interesting um, vacuum cleaners there. <laughs> Of course, it's played reverse. All righty. So what strives me or what interests me, first of all, is also like why we um, create technology. And uh, when we look into the nature, we can maybe if we compare ourselves, for example, with animals, then we as humans are actually not really yeah, I think not really um, protected in the environment we are living in, right? I mean, think about turtles. They have like, they are protected, right? They can basically save themselves. Also, we don't have really like defense mechanism in that sense. Think about um, snakes, right? They have poison. And we develop, you know, weapons or whatever. And the same is also true for us when we try to self-navigate or orientate ourselves here in the world. So, for example, dogs, they, they mark the surrounding and therefore they know where they are. Or we have birds, they have this kind of, you know, compass, echo load, uh, bats, for example, and somehow they also know then in where, where uh, direction they need to fly. And what we do um, to do or to get the same effect is basically we create maps. And um, maps are for us a way of how we can navigate us in this kind of special area. First of all, I would like to tell you a story about this place, which is called um, Aglo. Have you ever heard about it, somebody? So Aglo is an interesting place. Basically, there was a map maker, um, Otto G. Lindenberg, and he was a, yeah, I would say professional map maker back in the um, 20s, 1920s. And he created maps and sold it to different companies. For example, petrol oil companies like Esso, Exxon, and so on, Standard Oil. Because what they wanted, they wanted to have maps 
that uh, where people know where's the next petrol station. And he went out there, measured the land and um, sold it to them. And what Otto G. Lindenberg, what he did, um, he was thinking about how can I protect my material? How can I, you know, watermark it in a way so that nobody can copy it? Or if somebody, if somebody is copying it, I can sue them. And what he did, he placed this town Aglo into the map, uh, which is so-called a paper town. So it doesn't exist in the real world, it just exists on the map. And for him, it was like, you know, if somebody copies it, he can basically say, look, actually, you copy my material because this town just exists in my, on my maps. Um, this is like a, it's a, like a phenomena we're going to see quite often. We also know that, for example, in encyclopedias, like, you know, in books back in the days, there is this a woman called um, Mount Wiesel, um, and she's like a photographer from Seattle and so on. But basically, she never existed, and the people there, they just place it, this, this kind of insert into the books to protect their material. The same is also true for um, Google. Like, they are, if you type in some random types, um, then you will, be really, real, you will end up at the theater group in uh, um, Los Angeles. Basically, the types or the characters is like H, I, Y, B, B, P, K, whatever. And what they did, they somehow um, tricked Microsoft Bing with this because um, they were thinking that Microsoft is kind of copying their search results on Google. And with this technique, they proved actually that it is like this because suddenly when you typed in the same characters into Google Bing, suddenly you found the same results. And this was basically the trick by Google to prove, hey, you copy our material, this is illegal. Um, this is a thing that's called data poisoning, and I will go into this into the workshop later on. So just to mention, we have basically a, a branded or like a watermark data. But what happened then was here, you see also actually found an entrance on Google Maps as well. But what happened then was that there was another guy called um, McNally, um, 14 years later, and he published a map with the town of Agola. And then, of course, Otto G. Lindenberg came and said like, hey, you're going to copy my stuff. I'm going to sue you. We're going to go to court because, you know, this doesn't not exist. This town is just in my stuff, in my map. And then McNally said like, no, wait, actually, uh, let's have a closer look. Actually, people moved there and they created shops and restaurants and hotels. So it turned out actually that literally people moved there, they went there and, you know, out of nothing suddenly this, this, this place was created, you know, coming from a fiction, more like a, you know, story on a map and suddenly people moved there. Actually interesting to me is here that how the fictional virtual space turned into reality. And I think this is something we will see more and more, right? Um, um, that suddenly the data, so to say, started from a database gets physicalized. Um, but yeah, let's go into maps, right? And uh, maybe let's talk about a bit the phenomena of, of maps and how we're going to use them these days. I mean, basically, it's quite clear, you know, that we could say, OK, we have the, the streets, the rivers, and so on, and they shape the maps. And this is how we're going to define a map. But what's, what's more interesting to me is actually how maps shape the way we live, the other way around and how they're going to guide us, for example, through the city. So basically, the question to me is like, what kind of maps do you create in this world? And of course, this is the map as we know it, or maybe probably people in, in Europe most of the time. <laughs> you know, Mercator protection, and we see a lot of issues or problems in those maps. For example, it's like, you know, Europe-centered, and uh, we have Australia, which is um, down under, also so-called, because of that view, right? But I mean, imagine the map would be like this. Um, so that the center would be not Europe, but in this case, uh, it would be much more between um, Russia and the US. And then I wonder actually, would that maybe also has a bigger influence of how we see the world and, you know, don't see this kind of country so far divided in a way? Because in fact, they are quite close. The same is true, like, you know, what would it be to basically flip it upside down and uh, would it also then change the narrative, right? Example for towards Australia. Of course, we also know Mercator projection doesn't come in the right scaling, um, right? Usually, like, if we go back, we see that 
uh, Greenland is the same size like Africa, but in fact, it's, it's not, right? It's much, much smaller. But of course, these kind of scaling issues and um, distorted distance, distances can be used as an argument of power and can be used um, to um, demonstrate um, how, let's say, big a country is and therefore also to manifest a different, um, let's say, yeah, position. And then, of course, we also know that maps have been used to the right people, um, namely in the Congo conference. You know, we just took a liner and a pen and then you divided people uh, without uh, regards of their needs or even though basically just by the imagination of a border. And um, so we see that maps can be quite powerful and uh, especially back in the days, we had like maps that um, they were much more defined by the states and the military. And now these days we are kind of, you know, going into a new paradigm or probably even obvious since 20 years where we have digital maps, but I will tell you about later. Because what's also interesting to me is the other part of maps we have. Um, we have seen the map of the Mercado projection. This is one part how we create maps um, because the other map is the so-called mental map. So when we grow up, we create special information around the place we live, like what we see, right? And um, the place we visit. Uh, you could, for example, ask yourself, okay, how would it be to go, uh, go from here to home? And then suddenly we'd start to think about like, you know, what street I need to go, what places I need to pass, what junction and so on. And these are the mental maps we're gonna create every day. And there are two factors, how we, or let's say three factors actually, where we also have some kind of distortions in these mental maps. One would be um, that most of the time um, we have a much more detailed view of these mental maps when it's closer to our area. But if you're going more further away, suddenly it gets blurry, the distance are gets, you know, distorted and places are getting closer. Like you can see here, you know, the streets are very detailed and then suddenly there's the Hudson River and uh, then there's the Pacific Ocean, the same size as the Hudson River and somewhere then it's Japan, right? Um, so this is, first, this is something we all do when we're gonna create mental maps. The second part is um, also oversizing. So sometimes we have the tendencies that we oversize city centers uh, or let's say bigger places and we kind of create an image that it must be much, much super big, you know. In fact, it's, it's not like this. And then the third tendency is that we want, when I ask you to draw a map, uh, we have tendencies to straighten up lines horizontally or vertically wise. This can be seen here. Um, like if I ask you, imagine there is a boat going from the um, Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean, you would probably think that the boat basically goes from the left to the right. But in fact, um, it's not like this. Basically, the Panama Canal is uh, actually the opposite way. So basically, the boat would go from the right to the left and then right again. This is something that interests me as well. Like how we're gonna create mental maps first, on, but on the second also like who is kind of, you know, defining or basically gives us also inputs about those mental maps. And are we also in a state at the moment where we outsource those mental maps? When you think about uh, pinning stuff on Google Maps or like, you know, you're gonna pin a place you found nice or, you know, you went to a nice restaurant and then you market there. Is that also already like an outsourcing process of the area around us, like a bookmark, so to say. So therefore, I think I'm gonna go into a first project I did towards that. Analog maps had been replaced by digital maps. And here we see in the example, Umberto Eco, he was kind of, you know, imagine a map that comes in the scale of one to one. Uh, back in the days, he didn't know that um, digital maps would be uh, um, a thing, but I would say compared to uh, Google Maps or um, other maps, uh, we have that, right? We can access them to our smartphones. It's like a window, somehow this kind of invisible skin around the globe um, every day, every second percent, um, uh, present. These digital maps, of course, also comes with a lot of uh, limitations as the same true for analog maps. I mean, for example, still we have symbolic representations for cities, for like one tree, for forest, 
there's a, let's say also as well, a big generalization um, of this material. Here on the right, we see one of the first digital maps that was created. And uh, of course, on the left, you see then this uh, uh, probably more like a joke. But when we think about, okay, interesting. So this is every, everything there is running by data or databases. Um, then suddenly things like this happen. Like here in this example, there was um, a conflict or basically a, a, a bug, so to say, in the database by Google. And um, what happened was that uh, Google, they have drawn the, the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica in the wrong way. And that had the effect that the um, government of Nicaragua took this map as a way of arguing to say like, this land now belongs to us and we're going to send soldiers there and occupy it. And then it turned out um, that it was literally really a bug and because all the other uh, map services, they were drawing the border in a different way or let's say in the correct way. But um, it had basically this kind of, you know, effect, this physical effect suddenly. And out of this, I, I asked myself, um, is it actually true that we always see the same maps or do we always see the same borders in this example with regards where they're coming from? And they did this uh, project, um, which is called uh, Google Maps Border. It's more like a research project. And the idea was that I used the different Google Maps versions and scanned it around the globe towards the, um, the borders between the countries. And I was interested in if we always see the same um, the borders between the countries. And it turned out that there are a lot of difference and I can't show everything, but maybe more the, you know, uh, more interesting ones. And here we see on the left, this is uh, Google Maps Russia. And on the right, we see Google Maps Ukraine. And on the Russian part, what we see here is the Krim Islands. And on the Russian side, we see that there is a stroke line saying like, I oh know, sorry, actually it's a solid line saying like, okay, the island belongs to Russia on the Ukraine side, actually, I think you don't can, can't see it, but it's like a stroke line. So here, the state is unclear and it leaves a bit open, you know, who belongs or like who owns that land. It's a problem, right? I mean, how do we come to a common sense when we get different information with regards where we are coming from? Um, the same is also true here between uh, China and India. Um, and also interestingly, on the Indian part, there is the river. Uh, on the Chinese part, there's no. And then we have also the uh, Kashmir region, which of course, I mean, you know, right, these are always kind of political um, areas or like um, loaded areas. And <coughs> what I think what we're gonna see here in these uh, different material is that there is, you know, this new quality where private companies in the sense, um, Google Maps, they need to represent the local opinion and cannot um, draw, let's say, international maps. Because if they would do, I mean, to me, for example, I would say like, if the, the state is unclear, I would probably draw it in, in stroke line to, to leave it unclear. But if they do, then there's the chance that they lose the local map market and um, basically lose a lot of money in the end. Of course, this is another thing we have seen as well, and probably this will be more and more Im uh, embedded into um, our technosphere or like, you know, the apps we're going to use as we have seen it um, with Pokemon Go. So in this example, um, Pokemon Go and McDonald's, they cooperated um, through the map with each other because, you know, Pokemon Go used the data to place the, the Pokemons. And what happened was that McDonald's said like, hey, look, could you not place raw Pokemon in front of our store so that the young um, guys maybe then, um, you know, if they're hungry, they're going to get into our stores and, and eat something. And here we see basically the combination um, of companies interacting with each other through the map. And again, also uh, the outsourcing factor here for me is also relevant. And I ask myself actually why we also not have, you know, maps like, um, like this, why we always uh, use maps that uh, route us from A to B on the fastest route, why can't we not also have um, applications that take the most happiest or, you know, the quietest route to the city. Um, so this is something um, which I would like to see as well, but probably um, not in the main interest.
All right, Machine Win. Talk about the next project. So on 1st of May in 2019, I went to a 1st of May demonstration in Berlin. You know, this is like usually this is a protest that usually started to uh, fight for labor rights. And now these days it's more like a party thing. But basically uh, in this moment, they realized that on Google Maps, um, there was a huge traffic jam on the street produced by those people. And it was quite clear that Google is not uh, capturing cars. Actually, what they do, they are capturing the people's smartphone and created um, uh, virtual traffic. So I was thinking about, okay, how can I reproduce that? And is there a way to, you know, maybe empty the street by cars by creating a virtual traffic jam? This performance was created, which is called Google Maps Hex, where I used um, 99 smartphones and carried them um, in the street of Berlin, or a friend of mine, as you can see, right? And um, then, you know, we were thinking about also like what uh, areas might be the the focus in a city like Berlin, you know, where you could, uh, where, or where it would be interesting to reduce um, a virtual traffic jam. And then we were, for example, focusing on, um, on bridges. And what was interesting, and as we know that literally, like if you are in city centers, if you don't know where you are, we're gonna use, for example, navigation systems but also taxi drivers, food delivery services, and, and so on. They all use the same data. Uh, but once there is a traffic jam or like the application tells you, hey, look, there is actually something going on in, in front of you, so I can reroute you to another, like a faster route. Um, then slowly the streets were getting emptier and emptier by cars. And ironically, um, we created with this performance another um, traffic jam on the next bridge because basically right the bridges are just made for a certain amount of cars. And in addition to this um, uh, bridge um, location, in the same time there was another thing going on in Berlin because Google announced that they're gonna open their headquarter in Berlin, in, namely in Kreuzberg. It was in, when was it, 2018? And people protested against it because they were afraid of that uh, rents will grow and, you know, gentr gentrification basically will go on. And um, then Google, you know, had the feeling that they're not welcome in this area. And basically they quit the plan and said like, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna open it here. But then silently in 2020, beginning of 2020, they opened a new headquarter and more in the city center of Berlin. But Basically, nobody was invited, um, so there was no journalists, you know, no press was somehow reporting about it. And also, this is actually a photo I did, like, um, I, or okay, as you can see it, but yeah, basically it's not so long ago, and still it's the same if you go in front of it. You don't see really a big Google logo there as well, and the only thing you're going to see is like uh, on, on, the, on the door, on the bell, it's written Google. So somehow they're going to try to hide themselves. And what I also did with the performance, I created also a virtual traffic jam around the headquarter, this new headquarter, um, because I also wanted to make people of the city aware of that Google arrived in the city center. So you could actually say that somehow I mapped the map maker on their own map. So somehow I was drawing a, a red circle around them. It's like a, maybe a kind of artistic expression with a red line, so to say. And um, so, yeah, this was basically also another part of the, of the whole um, performance which took place. And maybe also as an addition to this, um, basically performance, I did it already in, um, I don't know actually, when was it? A bit earlier, so you know what I wanted to say? I, 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 I was, I, the publishing date of the project was one week before the 15th um, birthday of Google Maps because I also wanted to make people aware of that there's also a downside of these maps and how they change the world, um, or basically how they change the way how we uh, work in the, or move in the city. Maybe as another thought, let's imagine like this, we, we are going protesting out in the, into the street to make people aware of our topics. We want to interrupt them, we want to face them. You know, let's imagine um, farmers and they go there um, because they're too, too cheap, the, the milk price, right? And basically you have to wait there and then you are confronted with the topic. But 
when we have applications like this and they say like, okay, there's a traffic jam in front of you, I'm going to reroute you there, you will probably never get to know what, what was going on actually in front of you. And to me, it somehow cuts the democratical tool of demonstrating or protesting in a sense. And the question would be to me actually, could they also implement uh, things like this, like to somehow figure out why is there a traffic jam? And maybe also if you are a protester and you register this, you know, protest at the um, local government, maybe then they could also, you know, somehow place that in these digital maps as well. And this is a technique, it's very like easy to read, I would say, like a lot of people understood it also in the end. And um, to me, it was like uh, interesting that the feedback, the, yeah, the feedback I got by, by most of the people was like, I didn't know that my smartphone is being tracked. You know, I mean, basically we are still at this level when we are talking about um, awareness of um, technology. But also it was quite easy to read, right? I mean, smartphones in a hand wagon, very childish, you know, very easy to read. And um, there's actually another way how you can produce a virtual traffic jam or how you could, for example, um, send an army of smartphones to a place where we'd like to, which is called GPS spoofing. And um, I, will, uh, yeah, I will talk about this later, but just to give you this one first. All right, I guess you know already, right? If you've been to the exhibition or yesterday to the performance, um, the voice was talking about a place called Null Island. Um, for those who don't know, basically Null Island is located there. It's our um, center of the GPS coordinate system. Points, oh, so zero degrees north, zero degrees east, right at the Atlantic Ocean. It's somehow like 300 kilometer far away from um, Accra. And at this, mo at this moment, or actually at this place, there is a um, lonely boy swimming since 20 years, inactive and somehow represents that as a placeholder. And this place, you might kind of think, okay, what, you know, there's nothing basically what you can do there. But interestingly, it turns out there's a lot of activities in our digital sphere. Um, so imagine like this, so basically you're gonna upload an image um, on Instagram 
or whatever platform, uh, then they ask you always for your GPS location, like where have you taken this image, where, 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 was, it, where was it done? And sometimes our smartphones, they don't catch the right GPS location or something goes wrong, you know. And then they have to put something in there into the database. And basically by design, these databases are made like this, that nothing is not allowed. Like you can't do um, nothing in it. So what they do uh, by default is they just say, okay, if you don't know where it comes from, you just place zero zero in it. And uh, this zero zero then, of course, uh, gets uh, into the database. And suddenly, if you ask then, for example, in Instagram or Flickr or whatever you like, uh, please give me data back uh, towards the, the, the point zero zero, then you will find a lot of data. For example, like whatever, three million images on, um, on Flickr, um, 600 um, accommodations on Airbnb and things like this. But of course, also other stuff, because sometimes, you know, airplanes, they start or they land there. And it looks also that Norwegian airline, they have an airport there. So um, basically, uh, when something goes wrong with the, let's say, not, I don't want to say board computer, but, you know, the GPS uh, tracking of the airplane, it will um, uh, guide you there or shows you that it goes there. The same is also true as we remember, I don't know if you remember, um, this is the John Hopkins University uh, webpage um, during the pandemic, which showed all the cases, you know, the COVID cases. And in the beginning of the pandemic, suddenly we had, a, you know, a lot of cases at Null Island um, because the data was obviously not connected to the right point. Here is also different stuff you can find there, like a Burger King, um, of course, on Google Images, uh, housing markets, um, Flickr I already mentioned, different stuff basically. Also, I think a lot of segways are um, registered there. We could, um, let's see, jump out quickly and then go to, uh, I know the closest is Accra and then we go there. Actually, I'm also I'm not sure if you don't, if you didn't um, know it, but actually the maximum on Airbnb is 16. So unfortunately, not everybody can go now. Uh, but let's see. So we're gonna zoom out, and then we're gonna zoom in into the Atlantic Ocean. Let's see if we find something. <laughs> so yeah. And basically, you will find, you know, different locations and different places. And what happened here was that when they uploaded um, their accommodations, probably they were putting the wrong, um, for example, street number into the database. And then Airbnb didn't know where it is and it just placed it there. And I also uh, booked one, uh, like once I booked the accommodation here and literally it's like this, that Airbnb would guide you to this place basically. You know, you might think of, okay, maybe then, you know, one, you do the, the whole process, in the end it will show you where to go, but actually, no, it's really like this, you need to, you're gonna go there, you know? Yeah. Basically, here you see all the um, images I found on, I found on Flickr. And this is an installation towards this uh, place. Um, so you can have a look in the axioma right now. Mm, you will find the, the construction on the left. And what this construction, you know, also means basically, first of all, it's like a representation of the boy, but secondly, it's also like a hidden antenna because um, once you are in front of it, um, this antenna sends out um, a GPS position of zero zero. It's like a satellite, so to say, and then our smartphones get spoofed and think that they are at zero zero in this moment. And the idea would be here that the installation fills the space with more data once we are um, close to it. So basically also once you are there, a lot of applications wouldn't work anymore. Um, for example, whatever Google Maps. Uh, yeah, this is the exhibition at Soma at the moment. Um, yeah, and yesterday we did a teleportation or like a cyber teleportation um, to this place together with my partner Gloria Gamma. But let's go back and uh, to the place of Ag Aglo and um, maybe to recap. So what's interesting to me is this, you know, this fiction of Aglo or the fiction of Null Island. And at what point we're gonna say, let's place it onto the map or at what point it gets real. Especially 
the counterbalance between fiction and virtuality. Because like if you think about, I mean, borders, right? They are also just represented in a virtual space, right? I mean, basically, if you go between to the, let's say, Italian border, there's nothing in a way, of course, on the street, but you know, if you go in the forest there, probably there's nothing saying that there's a border, right? And I wonder actually um, if, if these borders are part of a map, why couldn't Null Island also be part of the map on the, on the other hand? If it's like also a fictional place, you know, exists, um, shaped by us, it's like a liminal space, you know, we basically shape this place, but it comes without us. And on the one hand, you might gonna say, yeah, of course, we should just put um, stuff into the map that really exists, you know, like whatever, streets and so on. On the other hand, um, fictional places, if you think like um, the Point Nemo or like um, the North Pole or, you know, things like this. I mean, these places, they are extreme points and we travel there and we mark them. And I think everybody of, of you probably did a photo similar to this, right? Where you move to a point um, because like this is one of the extreme points in the world we are living. And I think Null Island is a similar place, actually. If, you know, this is, this is the place where we start to um, calculate, to, to measure our current position on Google Maps. And then, of course, there are also fictional places, like this kind of stuff, you know, like Harry Potter, um, the, the platform, mm -hmm. or like um, Game of Thrones, you know, in, in Croatia and so on. And people move there, you know, they want to see those places. And they are basically part of a map as well. And maybe this is also interesting, like Loch Ness, Nessie, it even, you know, gets a note on um, uh, Open Street View. So basically my goal is um, to uh, get Null Island on the map. That's basically what, what this project is made for. And um, so, yeah, and basically by the end of the year, I'm going to try to move there, basically to travel there to this place and do a couple of performances. And with this, um, I think I'm running already out of time and I would say thank you very much. Mm -hmm.